So, welcome. Um, I don't know if you understand the title of my uh, presentation and Cloud Cuckoo Land. Uh, if you're thinking that you're going to see this, you're wrong. Uh, this is not about the Lego movie. Uh, it is actually more historical than that. Uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land is something that was invented by Aristophanes uh, about four, 400 years before G Christ. Um, it's a story about birds that live in a dreamy, uh, ideal world, completely irrealistic. And for some reason, I'm going to talk about putting our directory in a very unrealistic world. Um, so, who, the, those who don't know me, I'm Ludovic Poitou. I'm a product manager at Fortrock. I work on Fortrock directory services. Um, before that, um, the it was called the Open DJ project, which was a fork of the Open DS project, something we studied at Sun. Um, and I, I did a, most of my career at Sun working on directory services, from um, the Sun directory services 1.0 version, fork of uh, University of Michigan code, to the iPlanet, the Sun DSE, um, everything. So I know a little bit about all that. Um, but really what I want to talk today is about the cloud. Um, we are seeing uh, a lot of changes in our industry where um, the infrastructure is no longer what it used to be. When I started, um, my customers were deploying the directory on a machine and wouldn't touch it until it was no longer working. Um, we had telcos that were running directory services with highly available machines uh, with everything duplicated to multiple power supplies, multiple CPU cards that they could swap. And they had, were able to reach 100 availability for over five years. Um, as we moved to Fort Rock, um, as we moved to Fort Rock, I've started to see my customers moving to um, uh, virtualization, VMware. Um, and the, no longer running the directory on a physical machine, but they were running in a VM somewhere. Um, and that brought a few problems. But today we're seeing an acceleration of the deployment in the cloud. Uh, and we say the cloud is not just the cloud. It is actually this cloud. So um, the cloud that the, our customers are moving uh, is actually not one cloud. We are seeing the customers want to use any cloud. They don't want to be uh, locked into a vendor. Um, so what they're trying to do is find an abstraction layer um, that allows them to move from one cloud to another. And that abstraction layer is very trendy, is Docker, running with Kubernetes. Um, and um, this is a new world. Uh, it's a very fast moving very innovating, but there's no doubt that within the next two years, most of my customers will be running on this kind of environment. So what does it mean? Um, the story is a bit scary. Um, and there's many reasons why it's scary. Um, so the first one is a directory is a store. We're storing data for all the applications. We have a lot of state, um, and we have very valuable information that the customers don't want to lose. Um, and they need to have a full access to it. So um, the, the data that we store um, is the most important thing. So, we are not talking about something that we can stop and start and then move to a different machine like that. We're talking about a database. So it's very important. So it's such a difference. Um, so that we're pretty worried about how we're going to do that in the cloud with these environments. The other thing, I think the most scary thing, is my customers want to do it for the wrong reason. They want to move to the cloud because they think it's elastic. And so they're jumping like that hoping that they will be able to spawn a new directory immediately because they need more access. And then they, when they no longer need access, they can delete the directory and then sometimes 15 minutes later, a month later, they can start 10 directories. Um, 
This is the wrong reason. We are talking about a database. The data is the most important thing. It's not the processes. Creating a copy of the data, um, when you have small data, is fast. It's OK. But if you're dealing with millions of customers, this is taking minutes, hours. So you don't want to duplicate your data, create a new instance, and then 15 minutes later, get rid of it, because you don't need that. We don't need the elasticity for uh, performances. We need the ability to grow our directories over time. We don't want to shrink it back and forth all the time. So, but most of the customers think, yeah, it's just another web app. I'll just put it on Docker so I can scale it automatically, uh, pretty magically. The other reason why it's scary um, is we don't know yet how we're going to be able to sustain, support our customers on these environments. It's a new set of toys. Um, the first thing that happen if there is a problem, Docker will immediately, or Kubernetes, will restart the VM, will restart the container, and we lost all the state. We don't know if, if the process is blocked, automatically it will be restarted on another node. How can we troubleshoot that? Um, do we need to troubleshoot it? Well, if it happens once in a while, it's OK. But if it happens every day or every few hours, then we actually need to find what's going wrong so that we can actually apply something. Um, so this is a big problem. And this is a little bit of a problem for us developers. It's a massive problem for the people that are supporting um, our product. When I call the customers and I say, can you send us some data about the problem? I said, we restarted, we lost everything. So how do we deal with deploying our product in this environment? This is a challenge. Um, so we rolled our sleeves and we went to the job. And we did a number of things to our directory. The first thing we did is looking at uh, our configuration. Um, the way we configure the directory um, in Docker, usually you want your configuration to be stable, baked into the image. And as you need to um, change something in the configuration, you actually do it in your development environment. You rebuild an image with a new configuration, and you deploy that in production. So the first thing we started to do is separate in our configuration the things that were completely static that represent how the service is configured from the things that are dynamic, which is more how uh, the system is deployed. So all the replication configuration moved out. There's a number of things we moved out of the configuration so that we can actually bake it into the image or pull the configuration from the Git repository. So that was uh, a significant piece of job and we had to move different th things around. One of the simple things that we had to move was the directory manager entry. Directory manager is that one unique privilege user um, that you create and you use it for managing your service. This is the default user you, you need to have in case you lose all the other users. Um, we have a password policy for that user, which means that if something goes, somebody is um, trying to authenticate with the wrong password, we track it. Tracking it means writing data to that entry. So we have to move the directory manager out of our configuration. The other interesting thing about directory manager is that the password was in the configuration file. But in your development environment, in your production environment, you probably don't want to have the same admin password. Because it's not the same person that I'm dealing with the service. So we had to move a lot of secrets and, and, uh, and certificates out of the configuration, move it to a place where we can have different one in our development environment and in our production environment. So that was the first um, thing that we started to do. The second thing, we're starting to think about our data and where it's going to be persisted. Uh, in the Docker environment, you have local disk. But if the Docker image is stopped, you lose all your disk. So 
in the new world, what you want is you want to make sure that your data is persisted even if your VM dies. And so we use persistent volumes. This is a technology in Docker, in Docker and Kubernetes that allows you to have data that lives beyond the life of your Docker images. And persistent volumes are associated with one on, and only one uh, instance of the Docker image. So you can have a one-to-one -one mapping. Um, and so with that system, um, you're, you're deploying your production environment, your VM, your Docker image starts attached to a persistent volume and then starts to work. Now, this makes us think a little bit different about how the server is starting, about what it's doing and how you set it up. There's two problems. The first one is the initial phase of the data. The first time you're installing a new directory, you need to populate data. Um, that's one problem. But then over time, um, what is going to happen is you're, you're going to upgrade the image for the OS, or you're going to upgrade the image for a new version of the directory, and you need to reattach it to the data. And if you had any change in your news code that requires to update the database, you need to run an upgrade just on the data. So the upgrade process is different when your data is detached from your binaries. In the past, we ran upgrade it upgraded the, the configuration and then it, it did a, a bunch of things to the database. For example, it could rebuild an index if we fixed a, a piece of code that was how we built the index. Um, now we need to run upgrade on the, on the, the binaries um, in the development environment. We need to run upgrade on the data in the production environment. So we need to think about these kind of things. <laughs> Um, so <clears throat> that was one of the things we had to do. Another thing was how we run setup, how we do the initial configuration. In our process, we're trying to be very simple for end users. When you create a new instance of the directory, you can specify your database backend, you can even give an LD file that gets populated. You can do everything at once. Well, if you're building a Docker image that doesn't have any data, how do you populate the database when you're running in production? So it, it needs different processes and um, a different set of tools to actually build your environment. And that's um, a, lot, a lot of problems. The third one, and I think that was the biggest one, it's all about <coughs> replication. Our directories are there because they're highly available for replication. Um, <coughs> And replication is something that is fairly complicated. Um, and the way we designed it in the past, we knew the machines on which the directory was deployed. We knew the IP address. So we would basically tell a server, here's our, the other servers that you know, and then talk to them. And as we are configuring replication, we will build a trust that is required to be able to communicate securely between two replicas. But now in this environment, I'm s installing everything into my development environment, and now I'm starting something that is pre-baked in production on VMs that I don't know the IP address. I don't even know, I don't even have an IP address before it's fully started. So how to deal with that? So the first thing we did, we completely changed the way we configure replication so we can do it at setup time. We're doing it with two things. One is we have a unique certificate, um, private PKI certificate that allows us to actually be deployed on each machine so they can trust each other. And the second one is when you install the directory and you, you say I'm creating this backend, we enable replication straight away. So every backend is replicated by default. And in reality, the only people that don't enable replication are the developers because they only have one instance when they develop. But every customer that I have has multiple copies of the directory. It's always replicated. So it's now enabled by default. It makes things a little bit more simple. The only thing that I need to know when I start my directory is, is there another one that I can talk to? And that can be passed through an environment variable. 
So we have a bootstrap server that is um, part of property that is baked into our directory and then we pass that through environment variable. And that environment variable can be picked up from Kubernetes etcd or it can be used, you can use DNS, you can use whatever to discover what are the other instances that are running. The only one that doesn't know anything about others is the first one you start. And the first one you start knows only about himself. The other ones will start talking and then connecting and replicating. So that's a lot of explanation. Um, I'm going to walk on that skyline now. Live demo showing you how it works in reality. So let me switch to um, the other display. So, you can see my screen, it's large enough. So the first thing that I have here, I have Docker running on my laptop. Um, so Docker desktop, and I have Minikube, which is the lightweight version of, the, of Kubernetes um, on a single machine. So my own cloud here. Um, it's pretty limited, there's only three gig of RAM. Uh, I use only two virtual CPUs out of the four that I have. Um, but it's, it's a very nice developer environment. Um, everything that I'm doing, I can actually do it on any cloud that supports uh, Kubernetes. So we, we test on uh, Google Cloud, we test on Amazon uh, Kubernetes poster, I don't remember, AKS, EKS, I think, and then we are starting to test on Azure as well. My customers, they want to deploy, I currently have customers that deploy on Amazon and they deploy on Google. We run our own cloud on Google. I have customers that want to run it on IBM um, BlueShift. They're running on OpenShift. They're running anywhere. So we really have to have a single recipe for everyone. So this is my environment. Um, so what we have in, in our uh, environment is um, what we call uh, a deployment for Kubernetes LDAP as a service. Um, and what we built, when we build our product, we still continue to build a zip file, which is what customers used to, to download and install. But we're also building a Docker image that is an empty image. The only thing it has is the binary, nothing else. From that empty image, we, comp we uh, build a base image. The base image is basically the empty image where we run setup with no backend. Just installing, configuring the directory with the, the ports, the certificates, everything we need. Um, and then we derive another image where we say create that backend and load that data and, and, and that kind of thing. So that environment, um, we have a set of files uh, under um, commons which describe how we actually build. Uh, it, oops. It's common. Um, how we build that deployment. And we use um, two things. We're using uh, services, so Kubernetes services is the way you describe how your deployment is going to be. We use customize, which allows us to actually specify a very specific customization of our deployment. So we have a generic way of de describing uh, a service, and then we have specific customization for each deployment. And our key story is where we build the trust in, in there. Um, and then we have different ways to do it. Um, from that common image, we derive two different images. So one of them is the GitOps one. And the GitOps one is one where um, I actually uh, store my configuration in Git and then fetch it from Git when I'm starting the server. The other one we have, and that's what I'm going to use, is one deployment where I have a freeway replication service. So free directory servers fully replicating to each other. Um, and that's the one I'm, I'm going to use. And that uh, thing is very simple. Uh, again, it has a Docker file, 
the customization, and the customization is very simple. The only thing it says is replica number three. The number of replicas is three. That's all it says. Actually, I can show it to you. Customization. The service is DS, the count is free. That's all it does. Now, um, the one, the thing, the way I, I deploy that is actually starting scaffold. So scaffold is a tool to deploy um, Kubernetes environment. So it's 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 another tool on top of Kubernetes that allows us to to deploy in a very um, DevOps way. So scaffold is a way to um, deploy things. Um, the dev mod is actually one that monitors what I have, and every time I change something in my configuration, it restart, rebuild an image, and restart it with that new configuration. So it's a very development friendly. We have a way to run it as in production. So I'm using just dev, so it's, it's easier. Um, so just start load the image, starting a, a number of things. That's going to take a little bit of a while. Um, just pulling a that is Java 11 issue with Groovy. Um, just a warning. Something we're planning to fix, but it needs to be fixed in Groovy first. Um, so this is, you can start to see DS0 is the first server, DS1 is the second one. Um, and they're starting to be deployed. And if I look at my uh, console, I'm starting to see the servers are actually arriving. Uh, so I currently have two servers that are being deployed. The first one is fully started, the second one is not. Uh, the third one should be on its way. If I refresh that, I should now have more than that, more than two. So uh, because everything runs on a single machine, uh, it's a bit slow. Uh, it's a bit, it should be faster in the cloud. So starting to see directory server two <coughs> is, is on its way. Um, it's a lot of logs. <coughs> so that's the other interesting thing about Docker and Kubernetes. Your log files are worth nothing. If they stay on the Docker image, every time you restart, you lose all your logs. Um, so the way they, they do logs is they put everything on standard out and I capture that. Which means your log should not be very verbose, otherwise you're killing all your performances. Um, so a boot starting startup. Um, I can see the directory server two has started successfully. This is just a monitoring thing. Uh, and if I go back a little bit in time, I will see, where is that cursor? Here I have, um, 181 entries, I can see that my replication service has accepted connection. Um, DS2, and I should see, um, I should have connections from all the different servers. So my DS connecting to my replication service, so it's all fully connected. And I have three servers that are running, um, and I can actually access them from, um, so where am I? Should be on this one. So if I run a search rate, which is searching to, through a single port, that's searching across all my three directories. Um, and that's a very s slow search. I'm trying to, uh, not trying to hammer too much because Otherwise, I can't do a presentation at the same time. Um, so this is searching for my directories. Now, the interesting thing about this environment is not how I can search. And, and, and. The most important thing is actually, uh, if I look at my uh, deployment here, my directory service, I can go and I can scale. Oops. And uh, so if I just say, now, I don't want three servers, but I want four servers. 
it will immediately start putting a third one. Initialize it, start everything, and then start replicating straight away and take the load immediately. And that's the interesting, the interest of running in this environment is actually you automate everything for the customers. And the automation is not something that the customer builds, it's not something that the integrator builds, it's something that is built in the product. So every customer has the same automation. Uh, and it's easier to support, it's faster for the customers, uh, but it's also easier for you to understand what ha happened. Because your automation, your setup, everything it becomes code. It's no longer strict and... Uh, so I have the three servers, the four servers running now, and I should uh, be able to take so If I uh, look at the logs on that, yep, is it coming? <coughs> it is getting slow. Oh yeah, I should stop that. So, um, that is showing me that this server started and I had all the four servers actually connected and replicating. So if I do any change, I will see them on every, on any server. Um, now the interesting thing as well is I sent the search rate on one port that is forwarded to, for a load balancer to all of my instances. So it's, a, it's forwarding by connection, so if I open multiple connections, they uh, load balance automatically. And of course, um, going back um, to the, the overview and the service, I can scale it back to two, and that will delete the instances, but it will keep the persistent volumes with, with the data. So if I start another preferred one again, it will resume with the same data. Um, and that creates another challenge, which is, is the data that I'm using with my uh, instance again, is it up to date or not? So we need to automate or to detect whether the data um, is recent enough that we can resume replication or if we need to reinitialize the data from another server. So, um, so that was the demo part. Conclusion, happy ending. Is that all rosy and nice? Um, well, there's a number of challenge. Um, the first one is we're trying to run a database with a lot of data, and, and my customers have millions of, of identities in the directory. Um, I probably have about half a dozen customers that signed up for having about 100 million users. Um, I have probably about 20 customers that are running with more than 20 million today. Uh, and when I say more than 20, I think the biggest in production in terms of users that are active is about 65 million. Uh, the BBC in UK has about 40 million registered users. They use to, um, our product to sign up whenever they watch TV on their mobile device, on a set-top box. Whenever they want to vote to a show, they have to sign up. And so we have a lot of load. Um, the directory contains the 40 million users, but also has 300 million sessions stored in a separate directory. And I run, BBC runs everything with free copies, free replicas for the user store and free replicas for the, the session store. Um, they have more than 30 different instances of access management on top of it to do all the sign up and, and the token. So um, running the database in this environment is a challenge because the data is the most important thing. The persistent volumes, this technology is really new. Um, there's a lot of things that are still in early access version, in beta. When you look at the persistent volume API, there are probably about 20, 25 different types of persistent volumes. Not all of them are good for what you want to do. A lot of them are in beta state. 
you don't even know whether they're working or not. The biggest issue with persistent volumes is this, there's this one-to-one -one mapping between a Docker image and your volume. When your Docker image dies, when you stop it, it's okay, it stopped. When it dies, um, the persistent volume needs to be notified that your VM is no longer available, is no longer attached to it. So it can be available for another VM to start. Some of my, my, some of my customers have seen that this process of being notified and being available for another node takes about 10 minutes. That's a lot of time. It impacts your availability. So um, it is something we know we'll have to do. It is not something I recommend today in production. Um, but it's not because I discourage it that our customer is not doing it. Um, so there's a lot of evolution. Thank you. <coughs> um, we are getting really close to getting something production ready. Uh, when I say really close, we actually have it in production since last week. We have Forgerock Cloud that is running all our stack, including the directory, in a Docker Kubernetes environment on Google Cloud, available for our customers. Um, we're planning on shipping this product to, um, to our customers in the, the first half of next year. Uh, so we'll have more exper experience with it, and uh, we're building the tools to be able to support it. So one of the tools that we have is with the product, we have a tool that we ask our customers to run to extract the data and send it over to us. That tool, we need to find a way to automate it, to make it small enough that it can run very fast and autom automate it when the VM is about to stop or when a VM, the, the doctor image is, is about to be killed by someone. Because if it's stopping normally, we don't want to get the support data, but if it's stopped as aborted, then we want to get the data. Um, the benefit of that is really time to deployment is really much faster. We're talking about minutes to get a deployment, whereas if you're trying to do that manually, or you want to script it, it takes a few weeks. Um, sometimes in some projects, it takes months. But the biggest challenge I've, I've found um, is, as this is a brand new technology, um, we have people that are starting to say, I'm going to use it. I'm going to deploy your product on it. Oh, by the way, I'm building my own cluster. I'm reading the Kubernetes book right now. It's a challenge. People don't have the skills to run that in production today. They rely on the cloud providers. They just show it, throwing something at it, and just hope that it's going to work. So it's, it's really a challenge. Now, the other interesting aspect to it, what I show here, is how I can deploy automatically uh, a new instance of a service. I can repeat that multiple times. But what we're moving towards is actually continuous upgrade. Today, if I ship a version every year, the customers will upgrade it probably every three years, if not five. So they're always like three, four versions behind what we ship. With this automation, <coughs> because you can stop a Docker image and restart a new one, and the new one will have either an OS update or a directory update, we can start updating more regularly. Um, and for our cloud, we're going to push new release every three weeks. And so the, our, our team is consuming the new binaries, and our process, development process is such that we actually starting to do this continuous integration ourselves. So we're testing every build. We're testing whether it integrates fully with our stack. We're verifying that there's no regression. If we add any feature, it won't change. It won't be enabled. It won't change the behavior of the server. There's a lot of um, thinking about how you building new features and adding them to the product. The biggest thing is you have to be very careful about backward compatibility and zero regression. That's the, the biggest challenge. Um, but I can see a future where we're going to push these images to our customers 
And in the first, in the beginning, they will just try that on their development environment. But if they see that's reliably being able to upgrade automatically without them doing anything, they'll start consuming them. And I can see in a few years a time where your directory will be always on, running on these environments, and then updated regularly as bug fixes or new features are coming without having any interaction from the end users. So, cloudy feature, but looks nice. Do you have any question? So, um, open, or, um, Forge Arc is still based on, um, it's a Java-based pro process? That's correct. So, uh, my experience running Java-based uh, directory servers, garbage collection was a big problem. Is that something, how do you guys deal with that? Um, so the question is about the impact of garbage collection in Java processes. Um, the problem is not garbage collection, it's tuning in general. Um, the garbage collection is just one small aspect of the memory management and, and the overall tuning. Um, Java is evolving. Um, the one thing that I'm seeing is also with these environments, I don't see any customer that is going to deploy a directory for 100 million users on a Docker image that makes 128 gig of RAM. So what we're seeing is actually the, the machines, the virtual machine's memory is actually getting smaller and smaller. I have a customer who says, I, I will never deploy a Docker image greater than 32 gig, even if they have 60 million users on it. To, to deal with. So one of the things we're, we're working on um, is performance is very important. Um, but what we're working on is on efficiency so that we can actually run with smaller VMs. And with smaller VMs, the GC becomes less of a problem. Um, so it is still a problem. Uh, but in a, in a pretty well-managed environment, it's getting almost uh, not, a, not an issue anymore. Uh, you mentioned about replicating, uh, setting up a new instance, taking a few minutes. Yep. Right. Uh, is that including the replication at a file system level, or is it at the lab level? Or do you replicate it all? Um, so when, you, when I deployed here, and that, that took like less than, than a minute to add a new replica, um, the initial population of the of the data is the thing that will take the most time. Okay. I only have one and uh, one hundred and eighty something entries. It's <coughs> pretty fast. This is two things we're working on. One is we're working on uh, being able to send the data over the wire. Mm -hmm. So once you enable repetition, we can initialize the, the database over the wire. Uh, all the wire being on a an application level protocol. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we don't want to do that for every database. Uh, if it's small enough, it's faster to do it over the wire, so over replication. If it's large, we want to be able to actually take a backup and restore that backup on the other machine. So we have both ways to do it. Today we do it with the backup restore, uh, but we want to automate that uh, through our, our processes. Thank you. Just one more question. Uh, you mentioned about the load balancer between the containers. Yep. Is it at the TCP level or is it the application protocol again? Uh, the load balancer at the Kubernetes level uh, is at the connection. Okay, that, level. that, that brings to my follow up question. Uh, if, if it is about you know, uh, high availability, why not doing some kind of like search operation on attribute based policy load balancing? Something like that. Did you, did you consider something like that? I'm not sure I get the question. Uh, like, because you know, like if the load balancer is at the Kubernetes level, then uh, it's only putting your request based on the connection level. But well, not actually limiting the I mean, uh, not taking the constraint, not taking the the load on the actual instance of that lab server into consideration. Yeah, I uh, okay. So the question is about the load balancer that we use in Kubernetes. So there are there are different options. One is to um, to the the benefit of load balancing, when you have a, a service that has multiple instances, Kubernetes gives you a load balancer out of the box. There is another one that's called Ingress, which is the default one where you can control more, more what it does, but Ingress only works on HTTP. Um, so, 
the other option is to actually use another proxy. Uh, but that creates a more complex service where you have to have your LDAP proxy that is actually the service you're exposing to Kubernetes and it needs, still needs to have a load balancer in front of it. Right. Um, and then your LDAP proxy can do a better job at load balancing across your directory services with data considerations. Uh, so this is just a simple deployment. Okay, and, and one final one. Great. Uh, you mentioned about using PKI to establish a trust relationship. And uh, did you also, um, obviously, you must have considered about uh, you know, a certain period following in the wrong hand or something. Uh, how do you deal with that? Um, so the question is about PKI and certificate getting in the wrong hands. The wrong hands. Um, in the sort of setup where you just automatically set up a. Yeah, what so. What prevents me from setting up a rogue node? <sighs> rogue node? No, so the way the way we we doing, uh, we set up a private PKI infrastructure for each deployment, um, which basically is only trusted within that environment. Uh, and we, um, when you install the directory server, you have the choice. You can provide your own uh, key store and trust store with your own PKI infrastructure, or we can generate a private PKI system with a, um, what we call a deployment team, which is like the product root CA, and then we derive certificates that we can rotate uh, from that. And all the security is derived from that. So um, SSL, uh, uh, mutual TLS, our database encryption is all derived from that uh, master key. And that one is actually uh, not even physically stored on the server. It's generated on the fly. Um. So, Yes. You talk about load balancing for operations. Uh, does it include the write operations? And how do you manage uh, write uh, balanced on over uh, many uh, nodes? How do we? So the default load balancer for Kubernetes is based on connections. Mm. Um, we have only multi-master replication. So we always write to whatever directory you want. Now, one of the issues with multi-master replication is, um, is the data consistency at application level. Because if you, if you write on one server and you read on another one and the replication hasn't occurred yet, then you may get some inconsistencies. Uh, we solve that by doing load balancing um, at a proxy level with uh, better consistency. So we call affinity mode um, and that uh, load balancer is part of our SDK, so our application is using that as well. As I said, we can install a proxy in front to do to deal with that and route writes to the right server. Um, but that's that's not a problem with Docker. It's more a problem with LDAP in general and how we do things. Okay. Uh, is uh, is each each uh, directory so container? Has LDAP data in locker or the external storage? External storage. So the Docker image only has um, the binaries and the configuration. And data is external on persistent volume. So mounted disk. Is each server Each server, each server, each Docker image yeah, yeah. has an external disk for the data. Or, instance, or instance, it's one per image, one copy per image. Well, thank you. It's uh, time's over. And on to the next presentation.